Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I can't see you, but I hope you can see me. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the truth about free will. The truth about free will is that within certain limits, we are indeed free. This is a practical reality, and yet it has seemed to some people to be theoretically impossible. In addressing this contradiction, I'm going to take the arguments to places where those who defend free will and those who deny it do not usually go. And for this reason, the argu argument may occasionally prove quite difficult. And I hope I should be forgiven because I believe that the difficulty is inherent in the subject. So fasten your seatbelts and let's go. When I say that free will is a reality, this is something that pretty well everyone accepts in practice. We acknowledge the difference between something that happens to me, as when I fall down the stairs, and something that I do, as when I walk down the stairs at the start of a journey to London to attend a meeting. We praise and blame others inside and outside the law courts. We own up to actions which we feel we own. The fundamental difference between it happened and I did it lies at the heart of human relations and indeed of what we expect of each other. So much of the practice, or well, what about the theory? Actions are material events. Material events are connected by laws, causes, or indeed law-governed causes. Laws are by definition unbreakable. So what I do must be as subject to the laws of nature as other happenings in the universe. And causes have prior causes. And these have earlier causes. And indeed, we can trace this causal ancestry at least to events that took place before I was born. I cannot, it would seem, therefore, deflect the course of events. Instead of being the true origin of my actions, I am merely a conduit through which the material world passes in accordance with the unbreakable habits of nature. This is the case for what philosophers call determinism. So it's looking pretty bleak for those who believe, as I do, that we have free will and that we're in an important sense the source of our actions. But there is worse to come. Firstly, we rely on the laws of nature for our actions to have predictable consequences. I expect law-governed causality based on the reliable habits of the material world to, to, to deliver the outcomes that I want. If action and reaction were not always equal as opposite, as dictated by Newton's laws, we could not walk to the shops. And then there are recent studies in neuroscience that have seemed to show that it's not we but our brains that are calling the shots when we engage in voluntary actions. In the famous experiments by Benjamin Libet and later John Dylan Hayes, subjects were asked to make a simple movement of the fingers or their hands at the time of their own choosing. They were asked a time when they formed the intention to make that movement. And the experimenters examined brain activity using various technologies. And what they found was that the brain activity associated with a preparation to make a movement occurred before the subject was aware of having formed the intention or the urge to move. The interpretations of these experiments have been, to put it mildly, overexcited. They have been thought to demonstrate that our brains are calling the shots. We are at our brain's bidding. It confirms what many philosophers believe, that free will is a feeling, but it is not a force. Our sense of being control, in control, as one experimenter has put it, is like that of a child moving a plastic, storing, plastic toy steering wheel next to the real thing held by its parent. There are many methodological problems with the studies of Libet and Dylan Hayes, and I'm very happy to discuss them in question time. But I won't talk about them now because there's something more importantly wrong with these studies as attempts to investigate free will and as attempts to adjudicate whether we have free will or not. What's wrong with them can be summarized very simply. They completely misrepresent the nature of voluntary action. We can see this by thinking about the subjects participating in the experiment. The study focuses on the subjects moving her hand or her finger, a very simple movement. But participation involves much more than that. It requires getting to the laboratory on time after a complicated journey to the relevant room and perhaps setting the alarm the night before to make sure the appointment is not missed, and even making other complex arrangements to ensure the appointment is honoured. Additionally, it requires that the subjects 
could under should understand the general purpose of the experiment and the part they are to play in it, following the instructions and accepting reassurances that participation was entirely safe, notwithstanding all the intimidating equipment and all the folk in lab coats. None of this is represented in a simple movement of the hand. That, that movement is an expression of agency of free will, only insofar as it is an element of the action of voluntarily participating in the experiment. In other words, as part of a much greater whole, looking at the hand movement in the context of the experiment as just a hand movement is rather like seeing a much trailed handshake between two national leaders as a mere arm movement. What the subject is doing, in other words, is not merely moving her hand, but participating in an experiment. The decision is not to move the hand or to move the hand at a particular time, but to take part in the experiment, something that has to be sustained over a long period of time and hardly corresponds to a simple decision or an urge. And then we need to consider the role of the experimenters who had been working in neuroscience for many years, who had acquired the necessary skills to design and carry out the experiments and had secured the funding and collaborative expertise to carry them out, write them up, publish them in the relevant professional journals. None of this looks like something cooked up in an isolated brain calling the shots or even clusters of causally interacting brains. Widening our attention beyond the subject to the experimental team reveals even more clearly how the experiment, like most normal cooperative human activity, is not the product of a succession of discrete urges or discrete decisions strung together. This is not how free will works. So we may conclude that experiments supposedly demonstrated that it is our brains and not ourselves that are calling the shots are nothing of the kind. But these experiments are nonetheless informative because inadvertently they are reminders of the true nature of action. When I do something intentionally, my intention is not a discrete cause of what I do. My intention is inseparable from my situation and from broader aspects of myself. And these cannot be separated from the body that literally situates me. More broadly, I could not do what I do unless I knew what I was doing and why. This is a long way from law governed causes. A stone does not have to understand why it is falling in order to fall. What a human agent does is shaped by an explicit goal, something that she herself entertains, even if it is an action she does reluctantly. reluctantly. This is a sense in which, as many philosophers have pointed out, Actions do not have causes, but reasons or justifications. And reasons and justifications are not causes. The most obvious difference between reasons, for example, and causes is that instead of being a causal push from behind, there is a pull from the, from the front, from the future, from a sense of a desired possible state of affairs, which we see or imagine and which we wish for. This is particularly evident when the goal is long term such as getting fit or learning to cope with shyness. The numerous elements, physical elements, that are sewn together in the performance of such an action would have zero possibility of coming together as a result of the unguided operation of the laws of nature. Take my going to the gym for several years in the hope of getting fit. It involves car journeys, freeing up time, buying and wearing the appropriate kit, making sure my subscription is up to date and so on. This is an ordering of events unlike anything seen in nature. Granted, all these elements are realized in physical movements, but those physical movements would not have come together had they not been requisitioned by a goal, as it were, transilluminating the whole sustained operation. My physical movements happen and happen in the order they do only because I know what I'm doing and why, because they are justified by a goal that I have and are requisitioned in order to achieve that goal. Actions that have actions have outcomes that happen because and only because someone wanted them to happen. This is a crucial difference between mere happenings in nature and the doings of human beings. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.